Hyvää iltaa. Good evening from Helsinki. My name is Ter Himelsa and I'm the CEO of the Fulbright Finland Foundation. And on behalf of our foundation, it is my privilege to wish you welcome to this webinar. This is the sixth session in our 10 part global webinar series titled Internationalization of Higher Education in the COVID-19 Era. We have 425 registered participants today from across the globe. Thank you for joining us. The large number of attendees speaks directly of the importance of today's topic, championing diversity, equity, and inclusion in international education. Diversity is a fact of life. Equity is a human right. In practice, however, more often than not, societies are not there yet, and the field of international education is no exception. Study abroad and exchange these cohorts generally are not truly representative of the societies that their participants come from, and a multitude of complex challenges, quite different depending on the culture and context, affect on access and the experience. So how do we get there? The COVID-19 pandemic has put study abroad programs largely on pause. The silver lining of the situation is that it has allowed us a unique opportunity to take a pause, to look in the mirror and to reflect on the field itself. It is an opportunity to have the conversation. Today, we are very pleased to have with us two thought leaders from the field to share and discuss their insights with us. Amy Henry is Executive Director of International Education at Georgia Institute of Technology. And Tonia Hope is Director of Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University. Welcome, Amy and Tania. We are delighted to have you both with us today. And I'm pleased to welcome today's moderator, Itonde Kakoma, who serves as a member of the leadership team and director for global strategy at CMI, Marti Ahtisaari Center. He's also a member of the board of directors of our foundation. Thank you for being with us, Itonde. And from our foundation team, Assistant Director of Strategic Partnerships and Initiatives, Lisa Weimer will be moderating the Q&A segment. And for that, monitoring the questions that you can submit in the Q&A box throughout this webinar. I also wanna give a big thank you to the entire events team here in Helsinki. And a special thank you to our partners in this webinar series, the USA Study Abroad Office of the US State Department and the Association of International Education Administrators. We're delighted to be working with you. And now I want to turn it over to the Chief of USA Study Abroad, Heidi Manley. Terhi, thank you so much for the introduction. And as always, thank you and your team for being such a terrific partner along with AIEA and for joining us for this global webinar series. I am so honored to be here today on behalf of my USA study abroad team at the US Department of State to open this important conversation on championing diversity, equity, and inclusion in international education and to learn from you all. As Secretary of State Antony Blinken said, our greatest strength at home, but also abroad is our diversity. At the State Department's US study abroad office or USA study abroad, we seek to increase the number of American students studying abroad and to reach parts of American society that are currently underrepresented in study abroad so we can reflect the wonderfully diverse face of America overseas through our programs. Consequently, we also want to have more of our young people travel safely to destinations where fewer Americans have studied to provide a better representation of the United States within the campuses and communities in which they study and live to give a sense of Americans beyond just the pervasiveness of our popular culture through our best asset, our people. We achieve these goals by directly supporting more than 3,500 Americans on overseas and now virtual programs every year through our Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program 
and the Critical Language Scholarship Program, programs in which we, over the past few years, have been working hard to better match our recruitment of diverse talent with better support systems through the full program cycle, to better situate our students for successful experiences while overseas, and how to translate those experiences into the next steps of their academic or professional journeys when they return home. We also provide small grants to US colleges and universities to increase and diversify their study abroad programs or to create resources for underrepresented students to study abroad, such as a guide for deaf and hard of hearing students or a resource for Hispanic students, which are currently being developed by two of our recipients. Both the Gelman program and our ideas grant competition are currently open and you can visit our website, study abroad, Dot state dot gov to learn more. But as we all know, the need is vast. So we also host conversations such as the ones we are having today so we can continually do what you all do, which is innovate and improve. We know that truly championing diversity, equity and inclusion in international education requires immense work, dedication and change by all of our stakeholders in the field. And we are proud to be part of this effort to always try to get and be better. We have an immense opportunity before us to build back international education better, not simply to return to the status quo. And that includes thinking about access and equity because talent is universal, but opportunity is not. So with that in mind, I am thrilled that two of our US higher education leaders have joined us today to help us frame about how we think about this going forward. Amy and Tonia, thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And a special thank you to Atande for your time and attention today. We are very grateful to you all, as well as to all of you in the audience for being with us today. Over to you, Terhi, to begin today's conversation. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Heidi. Today's webinar is discussion-based and we are drawing on the questions that you have sent when registering for the webinar. And throughout the discussion, you can submit additional questions in the Q&A function. You can find the icon at the bottom of your screen. This allows you to view other questions and comment on them and vote on them with the thumbs up if you want that question to be asked. We really encourage you to be engaged. And with that, I will now hand it over to our moderator, Itonde Kapoma. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, dear colleagues, uh, Heidi, and all who have made these arrangements uh, possible. We're so looking forward uh, to today's discussion, and we welcome both Amy Henry, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Tonya Hope Navas of Howard University uh, to this forum. Hi, Amy, and I believe there you are. Hi, Tonya, coming in. Now, without further ado, I mean, we're looking at how to encourage students to reflect on their identity, the local environment, how to navigate an international context that may be distinctly different than their own. And with that, I would pose a couple of questions to you for consideration. First up, what are your thoughts on the future of international education, especially now that we have all been educated to exist and operate in a virtual world, what will international education look like post COVID? Amy, why don't you kick off? Welcome. Thank you, Itande. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you to the Fulbright Finland Foundation and to the Department of State for offering this opportunity for this dialogue. Um, in terms of thoughts about uh, international education post COVID, it will certainly obviously include more virtual exchange and mobility. But I think it will also include better virtual engagement opportunities as well as more global at home opportunities. The pandemic prompted a lot of innovation to launch new opportunities and it really drew attention to programs that were already in existence. Um, so many of the options that we have are so much better than they were in the past because there's more effort to integrate the local community with global efforts. So you see things like cohort-based programs that explore the global dimensions of the local community or region. Um, you also see programs that are taking students into local communities to do their global service learning. Nevertheless, 
leaving our physical, mental, and emotional comfort zones is still a transformative experience that cannot be replaced through virtual activities. So all those things are complements to, not replacements for physical mobility. And after uh, this pandemic, when travel can really resume, mobility will be possible again. My biggest hope is that international education will be more inclusive. Now is the time for us to evaluate our policies, our practices, our programs, and lay the groundwork for more inclusive international education. Tania? Thank you, Amy. Tania, would you like to further respond to this idea of what will international education look like post-COVID? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you all to, to Fulbright, Fulbright Finland, to the State Department and AIEA for uh, working on this, uh, what I think is a very important conversation. And hello to everyone all over the world. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, morning here in Washington. Um, I actually don't have too much to add to what Amy said. Um, I, I echo everything that she said, actually. I am concerned that um, there is going to be a shift towards more technology, which <clears throat> in certain circumstances is going to be a good thing. However, I am concerned because I don't want technology, as Amy stated, to replace actual physical mobility. I also don't want technology to be a substitute for students who financially are not able to move physically to another country. Um, and so, you know, talk of increasing access to students and their ability to engage in, in international learning through technology could also, if we're not careful, create another uh, chasm between the haves and the haves not, have nots. And I don't want technology to do that. So as Amy said, I hope that technology complements, but I hope that it does not replace and certainly does not create more division in, the, in those who are able to travel and those who are not. Um, <clears throat> I also think, uh, as Amy said, that that in this post-COVID, post-Trump, and post-summer um, of 2020 in the U.S. world, uh, that international education uh, will be more inclusive uh, in terms of access to mobility, but also just in terms of the recognition of the value um, and, and a new, a new, a renewed appreciation for everything that people from every corner of the world bring to every aspect of our lives. I think that we've had an opportunity to kind of reflect a little bit and I hope, I am hopeful that uh, that time to reflect will lead to some changes in the way we do international education moving forward. Very clear, Tonia. Thank you for this, both of you, touching on the way in which COVID-19 prompts innovative solutions and also brings about the possibility for more inclusion into the future and more technology. Tania, whilst agreeing with Amy's observations, you also highlight the problematics and the challenges of precisely, as you put it, the creation of further chasms uh, and, and inequity vis-a-vis uh, -vis questions of accessibility if technology is the way forward. Uh, and you could even break that down further. Uh, equal access to bandwidth and suitable platforms to, to engage in a seamless way as we enjoy now uh, through technological platforms, not to mention security uh, dynamics that should be taken into consideration even more so. Now, I work in the field of international peacemaking and all of those elements you describe are precisely the dilemmas that the field in which I work are, are also raising the questions. Why do I say this? The, that while it presents the opportunity technology to expand the field, to enable a more inclusive peace table, if you will, so too in education, what we have to be mindful of are precisely those questions of inequities that may emerge with regards to access to technological platforms and tools. So the logic there has been, while technology and COVID-19 has prompted, accelerated the drive for the use of tech, Technology can be an enhancement, but not a replacement of the physical convening of people to interact, as you so wisely put it. Now, in the broader context of this discussion, addressing 
uh, how to best champion diversity, equity, and inclusion in international education, a fundamental question has been raised more broadly. How do we ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion as we recruit and attract future students, study abroad participants and facilitate an overall empowering experience? And to that end, my question to you, starting with Tonya, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean in the field of internationalization of higher education? And uh, uh, particularly as we have this moment to rethink the field, if you would, Tania. So I, I would like to <clears throat> pose, <clears throat> excuse me, to the audience and, and to uh, the panel that we maybe reconsider diversity, equity, and inclusion and add one more term. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Keisha Abraham, who is, in my opinion, a titan in the field of international education, recently shared with me that she is a Jedi ed educator. And Jedi standing for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And when she said that, my eyes kind of lit up like, yes, because we've been talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion for so long, it feels like so long in the field. Um, certainly since ever, ever since I've gotten in the field, you know, when IIE offered food at the launch of the Open Doors Report every year, which was a very long time ago, um, we've been talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the needle hasn't moved very much really at all in terms of access. And so um, when I think about DEI, when she said she's a Jedi educator, I was like, yes, that's like, that's the missing piece is the justice part. It is, um, we can't really engage in diversity, equity, inclusion if we leave the justice part out of it. How is it that we are going to um, really impact and affect change if we're not addressing the cause of the division, the inequity and the exclusiveness? Um, and that comes with justice and really truly evaluating what it is that we are, how it is that we are engaging in our work and, um, and moving forward. And so I just, I put that to, to everyone to consider, um, to really step back and think about if justice also factors into our DEI work, it should. Tania, what you say links back to your earlier, earlier reflection on the way in which increased use of technology compounds the question of inequities. And, and perhaps if I understand correctly, uh, brings to the table this notion of justice furthermore. All right, Amy, what does diversity, education, and inclusion mean in the field of internationalization of higher education as we rethink the field? So um, including justice, adding justice to the equation um, is brilliant um, contribution from Tania and her colleague. And I think there are also uh, four other things that came to mind as I was thinking about this question. Uh, one is making sure that we're doing more than talking, right? It's, it's, it's the justice piece, making sure that we're acting. Um, we have to set tangible objectives and um, we have to then take action on them because like Tania, since I entered the field 25 years ago, um, this has um, been something that's been talked about in US international education um, in any case. Um, so we need to set some objectives, take some action, um, starting with things like diversifying the faculty and staff who engage in our international education work. And that applies um, both to partners and uh, when they're hosting students uh, but also to us on, on, on the US side of things. Uh, we gotta look at our teams and take action to make sure we're supporting all staff and that we're recruiting diverse staff to be parts of our teams. Um, I think also that diversity, equity and inclusion and justice work post COVID has to um, make sure it's connecting the local context to the global. Um, in US-based international education, part of what that means is partnership with our own diversity offices or diversity um, professionals at whatever entities we're working at. Um, and it means intentionally supporting our students and our faculty 
in identifying and leveraging the connections between domestic diversity work in the US context and the concepts of intercultural development and communication that are commonly used in our field as outcomes that we're seeking. Um, it also means very practically getting more students to less traditional study abroad destinations, and it means getting more students from diverse backgrounds into those programs, very practically um, speaking. It's so clear and, and a, a clear roadmap uh, linking back to the justice question that Tania and colleagues at Howard have, have put forward. Now, you both come from two of the finest higher education institutions internationally uh, and definitely within the context of the United States, Georgia Tech with regards to advancing uh, the, the best and brightest innovative solutions uh, that we can think of in terms of challenges of our time. Uh, Howard University in terms of shaping leadership skills uh, for current and future generations, including uh, the United States um, first woman vice president, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and to this end, the center that you lead, Tania, uh, named after one of my own personal heroes, I had to get that in there, I, I promised I wouldn't, but I did. Um, Ralph, Ralph Bunch uh, is someone who embodies those principles you were describing, uh, particularly the last one in regards to, to justice. And I, I point to him and his narrative um, as it links to this conversation and the, and the particular historic role that Howard University has in creating that space uh, for equitable international education and, and the shaping of, of, of leadership uh, and minds. So Ralph Bunch, briefly put, I encourage all to read about him, born 1904, accelerates uh, in his, his career, including at UCLA to Harvard where he receives his doctorate. And so interesting that he goes on to study abroad, right, in London School of Economics, uh, Cape Town University, including Northwestern, and having achieved uh, his, his doctorate from, from Harvard, I believe he taught at Howard uh, first, uh, and thereafter working at State Department, so connecting all the dots of this conversation, all the partners here. And here's the interesting link then to advancing international understanding, a core tenet of the Fulbright mission broadly, writ large, is his being appointed at the United Nations by then UN Secretary General uh, Trigva Lea in 1946, ultimately brokering an armistice between Arabs and Israelis uh, in, in then uh, Palestine in 1948, for which he won on, on behalf of the United Nations, a Nobel Peace Prize uh, provided uh, to him in 1950. This is a rich narrative of a, of a, a leader in the field of both education where he chaired, I believe, the political science department at Howard for 30 years um, and an international um, peace. So help us understand, Tania, um, both that magnificent name that you carry at the center where you are director, but tell us a bit more uh, about how study abroad and diverse representation uh, links to advancing international understanding. Thank you, Tania. Sure. So, yes, uh, Ralph Bunch, um, I think, is a somewhat underrated hero. I, I know several people who, for whom he is an idol and an icon, but I think for a lot of people, he is still an unknown, a largely unknown figure, except for in certain circles. And that is unfortunate. Um, he was uh, an amazing individual. Um, he was the founder of the political science department at Howard University, so he created it. And so it is founded in um, kind of his vision of the world. Um, but I think before I, I go further there, I think it's important to explain for everyone who may not be familiar with um, Howard, but, but more, more broadly, historically black colleges and universities generally. Howard is an HBCU, it was founded in 1867 um, and uh, it was founded primarily as, as, as all the HBCUs uh, were um, to educate people of African descent at a time when they could not um, attend other institutions. Uh, they were not permitted to do so. And so currently there are 105 HBCUs uh, remaining in the United States. There can only be fewer, there can never be any more. 
because it was a it is a designation by the Congress uh, in 1960. So any any school founded after 1964 cannot be an historically black college. It has to have been founded prior to that date. So of the 105, um, there were many more once upon a time, but now there are only 105 left. Um, and it was, uh, as I said, uh, they are schools that were meant to educate people of African descent, um, but uh, they, they are, um, but Howard University, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, Howard University is a very special place. It's not the first HBCU, it's not the largest HBCU, but um, I think it does have a remarkable legacy in people like Ralph Bunch, in people like Thurgood Marshall, in people like our Vice President Kamala Harris, who have all um, been graduates of our institution. And at Howard, we try to um, uphold the legacy of those people that have come before. I mean, sometimes I sit and I think about what it would have been like to be on campus at Howard in you know, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the, the wealth of just literally amazing people in every single discipline that walk that campus and the overlap of of those minds being together is really quite remarkable. Um, in terms of study abroad at Howard, we have uh, been doing a lot of work. I arrived in 2015 um, and since then we've increased participation of study abroad over 400 um, percent. And so, you know, something we're very proud of, but still the numbers are very low. And so we work um, very hard to increase that number of, of students able to have the opportunity to travel abroad, either through providers or through faculty led programs. We created um, a movement, I'll say a movement, hashtag study abroad so black. If you go to that hashtag, you will see images of mostly Howard students, but not, not exclusively Howard students because it is um, an aggregate of of um, images that we wanted to put out into the world so that people who look like me can see themselves out in the world and feel like it is a place that they belong no matter where it is in the world um, that they go. So, um, and always keeping in mind to the best of our ability, this issue of justice um, in the programs that we design, in the programs that we uh, that our students participate in. And even if the program itself is not um, designed with justice as a central feature, our students in particular, um, when they go out from Howard University, they are always carrying social justice as part of their identity. When you think of students who choose to go to HBCUs, they've made that choice for a reason because they want to be in a place that embraces them and appreciates and acknowledges what they bring to the table as a person of color, as a person of African descent in most cases. Um, and so when they go out on study abroad programs, as we all know, uh, the environment is not the same. In, at a Howard University, they are completely surrounded by people who look like them, who, are, who excel in every aspect of their, of their academics and their disciplines. And then they go out on study abroad programs, which have, very few people that look like them. And it is a choice that they've made um, to leave the, the environs of an HBCU to go into this other environment. And they do so with a certain level of, I believe, a, an additional level of confidence and empowerment as a result of having spent time at an HBCU. And I think that that is what um, HBCUs and Howard in particular uh, provides for our student and students. And so we are we, we love to see that out in the world. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. So clear and inspiring, Tania. And I'm gonna continue in, in a similar spirit, Amy, Georgia Tech, uh, in the same vein as being a trailblazing institution, particularly known for innovation and technology. Share with us, Amy, how does international education and, and study abroad uh, more, more, more uh, to the point of this discussion, aid in advancing innovative solutions for not just today's challenges, but for future generations. Amy, if you would. 
So Georgia Tech, uh, we updated our mission in spring of 2020, and it is now that we are committed to developing leaders who advance technology and improve the human condition. It's a mission that reflects the technology focus we have as an institution. You know, realize that more than 75% of our undergraduate students are in uh, what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, we graduate more engineers than any other university in the United States, by far, in fact. Um, so we have this focus on technology, but we also have a focus on improving the human condition. And that allows um, us to keep in mind that the tie to non-technical fields is very strong. And the purpose of the innovation in technology is for a noble purpose, that of improving the human condition. Technology provides many tools and paths that can help us bend the arc of justice and be positive contributors and collaborators for making our community and the world better. We have a strategic plan that we released in November during serendipitously International Education Week, which is an event um, sponsored by the US Department of State or at least initiated by the Department of State. Our strategic plan has uh, six themes. One of them is connect globally but the real power for us and for international education is that there are global themes and opportunities um, for local and global contributions that run throughout the whole plan. One powerful opportunity for us and for everyone in international education across the world is going to be to innovate by including and integrating the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into our field and into our programs. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are referred to as the SDGs, are a powerful framework for us and for all of those we're serving and we're educating to use them as guides for planning our work and for fulfilling our purpose. I think international education is a very purpose-driven profession. Uh, it's not profit-driven usually, it's purpose-driven. Um, and I think the UN SDGs are a great way to help us frame that purpose inclusive of all aspects of planet and people. You also ask about how to innovate for challenges of today and tomorrow. And I think that uh, we have to stay nimble. One thing we have to realize is that change is the only constant. So we have to sort of steal ourselves um, for the fact there will steadily be changing and we will keep retooling ourselves, our programs, our policies, even the most perfect approach, program or policy for one moment will not be perfect forever and it will need to be um, adjusted. What we have to do is we have to keep listening and keep observing and use those as the basis to continually innovate. Amy, I'm gonna stick with you on the next question because you began to outline a, a kind of post COVID response. And we're gonna come back to that. If you could you just remind us or further elaborate on those initial thoughts that you had. And, and thank you for, for highlighting um, this, a, a, the uh, improvement of the human condition as the, a part of the very mission of Georgia Tech, so inspiring. Um, and also this reminder of, of change in the world in which we live as a constant. So in this COVID-19 moment, when international travel is for the most part on hold, it has given the field uh, of international education a moment to pause and reflect uh, on what international education was uh, education was before COVID era uh, and where we want to go in the future. Now you started outlining an agenda in this regard. Tania, you, you touched on this as well. Now, during this moment of pause and reflection, what tips do you have to better include diversity, equity and inclusion, there was an addition of justice, uh, into the future of international education? Amy, if you would. Sure, thank you, Itande. So one thing I think it's really important um, is to call people in. So to brainstorm with those who you work with about ways to have an impact. And if you're part of a small team or you're a team of one, um, then partner with another team on your campus or um, at the organization where you work um, to brainstorm together and plan some action steps and set regular times for, for follow-up. Because when things resume again, we're gonna get lost in the day-to-day -day and all the fires. Um, and so it'll be really important to have those times to check in to make sure that we keep moving forward to advance justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
if your work is reduced during the pandemic, it's not everyone's case, but it's many case, it's you know somewhat reduced for many people because there's actually no mobility, then it's a great opportunity to jumpstart Jedi work um, or to give it a big boost if you had already started. I think the first place is to start with self-work. We each have to grow as individuals in order for our organizations to grow. We cannot wait on upper leadership. We cannot wait on others. It is on each of us all the time to be the ones who are doing the work that's needed to move forward positively. Um, practically speaking, this is a great time to look at program policies, look at job descriptions, look at job ads and how you're recruiting people to your organization. Look at the support that's provided to staff on your teams um, and at your institution. Look at who you can partner with in your organization, in government, in non-governmental organizations. It is again by calling people in um, that we're able to make positive progress forward. Um, and finally, I think looking at really practically our marketing and outreach and whether those are inclusive. And that applies for US institutions and for partner institutions who host and run programs for, um, for US students or other international students is to really look at our marketing and outreach and think about the indirect and direct messages they give and how we can improve those so that they're more inclusive um, and that they're really um, helping um, those we're kind of recruiting, right? And trying to get involved in our work, understand that we are supportive of justice, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that we're really trying to call everyone in to this great opportunity to really develop global perspectives and global competencies. So clear, Amy, Tonia, you hear uh, this notion uh, developed by you and your colleagues at Howard on including justice already being uh, echoed by colleagues at Georgia Tech. So tell us, Tonia, then, during this moment of pause and reflection, what tips do you have to better include diversity, equity, and inclusion, dare we add, justice into the future of international education? Please, Tonia. Everyone can be a Jedi international educator. <laughs> Everyone can. Um, and, and I will return to that. I think that um, COVID has forced us to retreat inward and, and has given us time to reflect on the field. Um, and then you have George Floyd's murder and you couple that with subsequent protests um, and calls for justice with COVID, all of that together, we've had a lot of time to think over the last several months. Um, everyone in every field and every sector is taking stock of their own organizations, companies, institutions. I, I get calls almost on a daily basis um, since the summertime because, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I welcome it, let me be clear, um, but I think that there has definitely been like a whole lot of light bulbs going off over people's head when they step back and think about, and they look at their organizations and their institutions and realize that diversity is quite lacking. So they call us at Howard and, and like I said, we welcome that. Our students are ready. Uh, we're ready to take that on. But, um, but in checking for the diversity, they also have to check for the justice. And if they don't check for justice, then what we'll have is just people ticking the box when they hire four new people of color to their staffs or if they send some underrepresented students abroad into the world. But if they check for justice, they will have, they'll have to do the work to identify what got them where they were before and how, how to avoid getting stuck there again. So to return to the normalcy of January 2020 is, is no longer acceptable. Um, that, that version of normal where we talk about DEI to exhaustion without really doing the work to make meaningful shifts in how we worked. We, we throw money at the issue regularly and money is and will be necessary, don't get me wrong. Um, but the ability to think outside the box is really gonna be what's required. Uh, what resources in your communities exist that speak to JEDI principles? How can you incorporate them into your programming for students? How do you, and how do you do it in a way that's not voyeuristic and patronizing? Uh, you have to be inclusive in that as well. Um, 
I think that there has to be, for example, some, some institutions are under-resourced and they do not have the resources to be able to provide scholarships for their students to go abroad. I think exploring direct exchange relationships um, is going to be a good way to provide some, some equity, some reduction in costs that makes mobility more accessible. I, I know I've engaged with lots of uh, institutions abroad who are looking to serve as the provider function and only looking for American students to come in and charging them for it. Where what we would like is direct exchanges where tuition neutral, where really we're just paying for room and board and the airfare and some spending money. That's a lot more accessible for some of our students than all of the other bells and whistles that uh, are usually used to entice students to come to a particular institution. Um, and also, and I know this is a, a webinar about US mobility uh, of US students out, but I think when we talk about justice and we talk about, for example, these direct exchange relationships, we must also be mindful of the institutions that we partner with in other countries and their ability to provide um, support for their students to be able to come to the United States. So it's one thing for a US student to go to a country um, uh, where the exchange rate is gonna be very favorable to the US student, but not the other way around. And so that creates um, an opportunity to explore ways to be more just in our exchanges. Um, I think one other thing is um, better preparation for our students. Our students have expressed to us regularly upon their return that um, they had more issues with the students, the other students from the US on their program than they had with the students from the host country. Um, they were prepared well for how to engage with students and other people from the country where they were going to study in. But as, as I'm pretty sure the whole world has seen what has taken place in the United States over the last four years, our students are, I believe, experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder because of the last four years. And I think we have to be mindful of that when they go abroad. It's been rough to be a person of color in the United States for the last four years. Um, and so uh, better preparation of our students um, to go abroad, but also to engage with each other while they're abroad because traveling with people is a very intimate experience, I believe. And so when you are put in a situation where all you have are each other and you all don't get along, that is, that is problematic, but it's also an opportunity to heal, which I think is another thing that we need in this country moving forward. Um, I'll stop there. It was so clear. And, and we'll, we'll turn to hear from the audience uh, shortly as, as moderated by, by colleagues at the Fulbright Finland Foundation. But before doing so, I, I wanna, allow and hear um, tips, strategies, ideas from audience members in the chat box. Um, what tips do you have with regards to how are you exhibiting personal leadership? Both Amy and Tania described uh, some, some ideas there to increase diversity, equity and inclusion in international education. If you could please share uh, briefly activity strategies, et cetera, in the chat, we'd be grateful. And I, I see there's a rich conversation responding to all the points that you're raising. Now, I'm gonna go in a little bit deeper here on some of the questions. Diversity in study abroad. Why do we need it and how to achieve it? If you could briefly respond to this and then we'll turn to, to other colleagues as well. Amy. So diverse students are very likely to already be skilled in navigating difference in their domestic context, and they can translate those skills to new contexts and then expand those to help them participate in both defining and solving global problems. We need everyone at the table bringing their ideas and efforts to solve global problems. We have to have everyone involved in study abroad and in international education broadly. How do we achieve it? We ask students, for starters, ask prospective students, ask current students, ask alumni, do you want to go abroad? Did you go abroad? Why didn't you? What were the barriers? What were the things you faced? Because armed with that information and not with what we assume 
are the, um, the common barriers to people going abroad can allow us to engage them in conversation and then gear our work towards making changes um, um, you know, within our locus of control around the things that are gonna help us get those students abroad. Um, and most importantly, we have to act. We, as we said earlier, we've been talking for a long time um, and it's critical that we really act with more haste and more intention. Donia, please, if you would add. I'm gonna save some time because really she said everything. I think there, there definitely has to be much more intentionality behind this work. Um, I think talking to the students is absolutely key. I think our students are ready um, for these types of opportunities. They seek them out increasingly every year, more and more. It's becoming something that is like expected. Um, but we have to do a better job of, of facilitating opportunities for them. Everybody is not going to be able to go away for a whole year or even a whole semester. But what else can we do? What does it look like and how do we pay for it? Partnerships, um, you know, I think that um, the private sector knows the value of, of international experience and people that they are going to hire? Where is the private sector in sponsoring these types of opportunities for their future employees? Could be one thing. Um, so I'll, I'll save time. Amy said, Amy said all the good things. <laughs> and you added more good things. I, I, I see a strategic plan of action developing here. Uh, Lisa Weimer, Assistant Director at the Fulbright Finland Foundation, if you would walk us through uh, the, the questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tonde. Um, you know, I've been following the chat and the Q&A throughout the discussion, and we'll ask a few questions from the audience members in a moment. But before that, we'd like to ask all of our audience members to participate in a poll. And Mikkel, can you go ahead and launch the poll? Please answer this question by clicking all of the answers that apply. So we'll wait for everyone to <clears throat> have a little moment to reflect on this question and to answer it according to your own situation. And then Miguel, when you think most of the audience members have responded. We can pull up the results and um, Amy and Tonia, you can give us your reflection on these results. Okay, what do you think? Tonia, go ahead. I think it's great that it's there's such a high level from from the institutional um, at the institutional level that it's included at the institutional level. I think that's important because it absolutely has to start from the top and and but it also has to has to be strong at the bottom and there has to be a, a meeting in the middle. So it has to really be spread across the whole institution. But if it doesn't have, if it does not have support at the top, it really won't get very far. So that's, that's encouraging to see. Yeah, and it's really a call to action um, in many ways, because while um, probably most people on this, this webinar don't have um, a lot of agency over you know, institution level strategies and goals, um, we certainly do um, by encouraging the leaders of our departments, or if we are leaders, um, and with employees who we supervise or even colleagues, we can encourage them um, and make sure that we include them in our own professional goals. So um, I take this as a real call to action um, of a concrete place that we can make some um, written goals that we make sure we follow through on um, to have an impact um, and be Jedi educators. Yeah, it's nice to see that no one chose the none of the above. Yes. So the work is getting done. Uh, we just need to get out and do more. So I'm going to move us now to some of the questions that have been posed by the audience members. And we've asked the audience members to vote on those questions that they really want 
to ask the, the speakers. So there's one up here that's on the ethics of short-term study abroad. So my colleague Caroline Payne speaks of US international education, especially service learning, as 21st century colonialism. Short-term experiences in poor countries for privileged US students doing volunteer work for communities that are left their own devices after a week. How can we address this issue of justice in a more intentional manner? What do you think? Who would like to give this a shot? Tonia? Um, I, I, that has also made me uncomfortable. And um, I know that at Howard, what we have done is create more long-term relationships so that they're not one-offs. We have, for example, our Engineers Without Borders program um, in our College of Engineering and Architecture regularly returns to the same communities every year. Um, I believe primarily their work has been in Kenya and El Salvador, um, and they build relationships with the people over years um, so that it is not, okay, we're gonna go here and do this work and we'll you know, never see you again. Um, that is uh, something that we are always very mindful of um, not, as I said earlier, not to go in and be voyeurs and, and, and kind of just that, that feeling that you expressed of, of, you know, privileged students from the United States. It's not, it's not a comfortable situation and we certainly try to avoid it whenever possible. Uh, if, if we engage in it, um, I don't think that we do. We have, for example, alternative spring break as well, which is something that we do every year. We've been doing for a very long time, um, always with the eye to not do, um, not to be those those people that just come in for one week and and disappear. So. Amy, do you have any thoughts on that? My thought, um, I mean, I, I agree that there are some issues to be addressed and I think the best way to address them is through dialogue and conversation. I have a note here um, on my pen board in my office that has the word concern and it's marked out and it says under it, generative moment. Um, and so yes, there are concerns about the ethics um, of how some programs are run and that provides us with an opportunity that's a generative moment to engage in some dialogue and look critically um, at what's being offered and at how we can make changes that um, will make the programs of the kind of service that we really want them to be. And I would suggest that one way to do that is to make sure we engage in asset-based community service um, and that we're really looking at what the communities have to offer, that we're building on that. Um, and again, it's dialogue and conversation um, and really wrestling with issues um, to um, help us build better programs and make sure that we're engaging ethically in our international programs. Yeah, I think this idea of reciprocity is also an important one here. When you're working with your partners, your, your partners around the world, making sure that there is reciprocity in, in those agreements is always really important as well. Um, here's another question. One of my struggles is that I work in a predominantly white campus. What do you suggest I can do to help faculty think about underrepresented students and JEDI practices when proposing and recruiting for a faculty-led program? Any suggestions for this question? Amy? I can try to tackle this a little bit. Um, I mean, I think you can find people to partner with on your campus. So find your uh, most, um, if you're in the United States, at least campuses have, um, and most of the people who use the term faculty led study abroad are in a US context. Um, so uh, find your diversity office and partner with them. Uh, reach out to student affairs um, and uh, try to partner to work together to have some kind of an impact. I would say show examples you know, find um, programs that you think are doing a great job even at other institutions um, and look at what they're doing. Um, I know that um, there's a professor at Virginia Tech named Homero Murzi, M-U-R-Z-I, um, who has done some interesting work um, 
around specifically engineering students. This research is all for engineering education and students, um, but around how study abroad programs are promoted um, and then what they're likely, who they're likely to recruit based on that. So I think there's some good work out there to look at um, to get some practical strategies um, for making inroads. I also think make it as easy as possible for the faculty. So instead of you should be doing, it's look at what you could do. You see, you only have to tweak this a little and then uh, you're much more likely to get the kind of behavior that you're seeking. Tonia, do you have any thoughts on this? No, okay. I'm gonna ask one more question. This is an interesting one. Um, this comes from Michael Wolf. The notion that the promotion of non-traditional locations is part of a decolonizing agenda needs some thought. That concept forefronts the significance of destination over content. Shouldn't our emphasis be on what students need to learn rather than on the real or imagined significance of place? Prioritizing the non-traditional also creates a sense that students who study in Western Europe are in some way or another engaged in a less valid form of education. In practice, the cities of Western Europe have been reshaped by globalization and urbanization, forces that have re redefined contemporary reality. Isn't the dichotomy between traditional and non-traditional a little bit of an unhelpful cliche? Amy. So um, I actually agree with everything you, um, Michael, wrote. I have no objections at all to any of that. Um, for me, um, thinking about getting students um, away from other tr more traditional study abroad destinations um, is about just opening up the whole world to them. And it's one of many, many, many things that has to happen. And of course, context and content both matter tremendously. I mean, dropping people off anywhere with no good content is not going to be helpful um, for the goals that we seek. Um, so um, absolutely, you know, here, here to all of that. Um, and it would be a false dichotomy. I don't think we set it up in a, as a dichotomy in this webinar, maybe some others have, um, but it's just one piece of a strategy for thinking about um, how you're going to attract students and what they might be attracted to and also being inclusive in our thinking about what programs are available to students, that we don't only look at the same things that we have looked at, but that we think about some different places um, that might be of great interest for helping with collaboration and developing global perspectives. Tonia? Leave it to Michael to offer the very thought-provoking question. Yes, well, exactly. Hi, Michael. Um, well, I agree with what he said and what, what Amy has already said. Um, I would add that, um, you know, for our, I, personally, me personally, I would want to go to a place where there are not that many Americans. And that happens in non-traditional destinations. And so I, I kind of want that for my students too. I really want them to be uh, fully in, in, in immersed in another place without contamination from people, other people from the country from whence they came. So that's one thing. And the other thing, as I'm sitting here thinking, Michael, about what you just said, I also think about often, and, and I'm not saying that, um, I'm, just, I'm just putting this out on the table because, because you know, you're very thought provoking when we talk about international students in coming to the US and outgoing, often there is a economic conversation that happens. And the dollars that come with international students uh, and how that impacts the local economy. If they don't go to non, if they stay in Western Europe, then Western Europe gets that benefit. What about spreading some of that to some other non-traditional places? I'm just saying, that that could be another argument for um, bringing some additional resources to economies that don't have, you know, the economies of a Paris or a London or a Barcelona. So something else to think about. And we'll continue this conversation, Michael. I look forward to it. Yes, very provocative. Thank you so much, both of you. And I'm gonna hand it back to Itonde to wrap things up. Thank you, Lisa. And, and thank you also to those participating online for the stimulating discussion. 
as Denise said, much more to, to develop from there. And there are further ideas and questions in the Q&A and messages, so we'll be sure to pick up on those. All right, we've had a rich discussion uh, reflecting on championing diversity, equity, and inclusion in international education broadly, and here specifically, how study abroad and diversity therein uh, encourages students to reflect on their identity, the local environment, and how to navigate an international context that may be distinctly different than their own. And you've both done extremely well in highlighting some key strategies in this regard uh, to, to aid in thinking about not only the, the current circumstances, we're not post COVID yet, um, but also the world in which we may be uh, coming into post COVID. With that, um, your final reflections on what you would wish to convey today on the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion uh, with the addition of justice uh, as, as you advance international education. Uh, Tania, I'll start with you uh, for a brief uh, final reflection and then hand to Amy, please, if you would, Tania. Thank you. Thank you all for, um, again, for having me today. Um, I did not prepare any final thoughts because I just like to talk off the top of my head and, and, and draw from the conversation that we've had. And I will just end with the fact that these conversations, I think, are really important. I think we have, we've had more of them, I think, in the last several months than we've had for a long time, and that's a good thing, but I encourage um, all of us to go beyond the talking and, and go to the action. Um, I am available. Um, I'm always looking for different ways to engage with people um, and partners in different countries. Um, but I think that it is, um, it, it, it will behoove all of us to really think about what exactly it is we're doing, how we wanna do it. And if we're gonna keep doing it the way we've been doing it for the last 15, 20 years, or if we're going to be bold and innovative in our approach to um, being Jedi educators because I think that is what will be required moving forward if we have any expectation of change, significant, tangible, impactful change. So thank you all. Thank you, Tania. I'm just gonna keep your mic on for one second before turning to Amy. You, you helped us really reflect and understand more about the historic place of, of HBCUs and, and the formation that they've provided for so many leaders in the context of the United States and uh, in the international community. Your center is named after one of those prominent of many individuals. You also though pointed to a, a really profound point about where the United States is at moment uh, from a social transformation standpoint and upheavals in various communities and the impact that has on students. And you even used the phrase, if I heard you correctly, um, the kind of post-traumatic stress uh, that they may be exhibiting. Can you reflect a bit more on that before we hand to Amy for final reflections? And not just about US students as they consider study abroad, but also about those students who have come to the United States uh, and that trauma they may have experienced uh, during this tumultuous period. Just briefly, if you would, because it was a profound insight. I, I, think, <clears throat> I think that, honestly, I think the whole world has been impacted by the last four years. Um, <clears throat> we saw the way in which international students were essentially rejected from, from even thinking about coming to the United States based on revised immigration policies. And that you know, has turned them out to, you know, to other countries to look for you know, possible places to study. Um, that hopefully, I think already, we've seen a complete pivot and I hope that that continues. Um, uh, this, uh, the United States, I think, absolutely welcomes and wants students from all over the world to come to our institutions. And now we have someone leading this country who believes in that as well. And I look forward to returning and even increasing um, the number of international students that uh, were here before uh, moving forward. And in terms of our students, uh, going out into the world. I mean, like I said, this has been a period of post-traumatic 
post, we are now in post-traumatic stress because I, I personally am still kind of every day thinking, okay, don't have to deal with, I don't have to worry about what wild policy is gonna come out of the White House today. It's just, it's, I'm still in the process of accepting and processing that I can breathe a little easier. And it seems kind of, um, I, it may seem dramatic, but I really feel like I, I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. Um, it's just kind of like this slow revelation that we don't have to deal with a lot of that uh, anymore. And it is very refreshing. And I think our students are going to um, go out into the world, you know, also still processing that um, and, and open to re-engaging with the world in a way that we did before. And, but I think for those of you who are in countries where you'll be receiving our students, it, you know, be mindful of the fact that our students of color in particular are, are dealing with, with that, you know, built up angst and anxiety from the last four years that we've experienced. And refreshing to get out into countries that hopefully don't feel that way, but that, you know, US is the person who ran this country the last four years is not the only one that feels that way. There are leaders in other parts of the world that feel similarly. And so um, we have to be mindful of that when our students go to some of those countries, you know, how, how does that play out in their experience in that country? It, you know, might it, I don't know, might it trigger something in them? I don't know, things to be, to, to be mindful of. I'm going to think thank more you. about that because. Uh, thank you for these further reflections. I know it's it was a, provoked by your deep insight there, um, and and thank you for the broader perspective shared as well. Uh, Amy, turning to you, and you would have seen in the chat box uh, an affirmation or appreciation for lifting up the SDGs as a part of thinking through Georgia Tech's strategy uh, towards improving the human condition, as it's described in your mission statement. Any concluding thoughts that you wish to share today? Yes, I have, uh, before I give just a couple of sentences um, in conclusion, I want to just point out one um, tip that I didn't get to cover earlier, both for um, people based in the US, but especially for partner institutions, um, which is to really give some thought um, and then some action to how to support students in learning about the host culture beyond the obvious, the traditional, and sometimes, frankly, stereotypical aspects that are most readily available. I think it's easy to take for granted that students have so much access to media now and to information that they can find out about a place on their own, um, but we can still exert a really strong influence on the content of their experiences um, by encouraging them to engage with information about local issues and current events, to learn about 21st century societal and demographic changes in the host country and to ask locals also, of course, and be learning about these things. I would say for asking locals, you know, once they understand the appropriate ways to do that in the host environment, um, but nonetheless that um, we really um, um, helping students just like the, the US is not a caricature of only some of the things seen in the media nor other places. And so helping students who are themselves diverse um, but regardless of whether they are diverse in a U.S. context, helping them think about what diversity means in the new host country um, would be a great service to them and a great way for partner institutions to, to engage in, in JEDI work. Um, I think just in conclusion, um, I will say that it's really easy to see JEDI work as something for others to undertake, something others will do, something we don't have time for but it's incumbent on each of us to collaborate and to contribute to championing um, JEDI work in international education. So we have to do the work humbly um, and make sure that as we do it, we're able to be self-reflective. Um, and one of my favorite sayings these days is to look for a door to walk through rather than a wall to hide behind so that we can really engage in challenging discussions and make the changes that are needed to move things forward positively. Thank you. Thanks are to you, Amy Henry, Executive Director of International Education at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Tonya Hope Navas, Director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University. We're grateful to you for your insights today and as champions 
for justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion in international education. I turn to my colleague, Terry Mosela, Executive Director of Fulbright Finland Foundation for a final vote of thanks. Terry, please. Thank you so much, Itonde. And thank you, Lisa. And a sincere thank you to Amy and Thania for offering your candid perspectives and tangible takeaways. There is a lot for us to think about. And there's only so much that one can do within a single webinar. So this discussion too will have to continue afterwards. I want to point out to you the additional resources that our speakers have made available for you. You will find them in this webinar's website. We will send you a follow-up email that includes the recording of this webinar, and it will also include an invitation to the next webinar for which the registration is now open. Also, please take a moment to fill out a quick three-question exit survey. On behalf of the Fulbright Finland Foundation, as well as the collaborating team at the US Department of State and AIEA, we thank you for joining us today and hope to connect with you again soon. Wishing you a great day and mukavaa iltaa. Good night from Helsinki.